I think what, what the world in a way is waiting for is this next big innovation. Any process that relies on information would be automated. So that would automate the work of millions of jobs. The technological development which is going to have the, the greatest impact is uh, artificial intelligence. We just simply might come to a point where machines no longer serve humans, but rather humans serve the machines. It is important that we continuously reflect on how we use these technologies and what the implications of the, the use cases are. I mean, machine will learn faster than you eventually. And there will be nothing you can teach it anymore. What are you going to do then? Well, that's that's a good way to begin this afternoon. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, exciting uh, panel in the afternoon. And there are three, three things about this uh, session which I'd like to highlight. One, uh, it's not a manual. So thanks, for Rachel, for being here. Uh, two, this is about the technology which is happening now and which is happening in the future. We've had a lot of sessions with people who are leaders of the past. Um, and I don't think that that's a, that's a designation you'd like to keep for very long. We are talking about leaders of the future. We've seen companies that have been giants in their, in their fields. We've had a culture of the top 100, top 50, top 200 companies of the world who seem to lead the change, or perhaps not, uh, across the globe. What's happening today is 100,000 younger companies and organizations which are creating a distributed revolution across the world in lots of small little ways which are profound, at the same time are, are growing very, very rapidly. Let me quickly um, introduce the panel uh, that, that we have here on my left. Rachel Horwitz, President and Chief Executive Officer of Caribou Biosciences. Um, on my Further left is uh, John B. Rogers, co-founder and chief executive officer of Local Motors. On my right, Alec Ross, author and technology policy expert. And on my far right, James Kuffner, chief technology officer at Toyota Research Institute. And what is also fascinating about this panel, it's an all-American panel, but we are not discussing politics. So <laughs> let's, let's begin by uh, what I'm going to request the panelists is to give a short introduction about the exciting work that they've been doing, the products and the technology innovations that they have achieved, and then we jump right into some of the implications and how it's going to be rolling out in the next few years. Rachel, may I begin with you and request you to tell us a little bit about this editing of genes that you're pioneering. Absolutely. Uh, so my company, Caribou, is about a four-year-old startup in Berkeley, California, and we're developing a technology called CRISPR, which lets us go inside of cells and precisely change DNA sequences. Um, we really look very broadly at the applications of this technology, anything from new therapeutics, agricultural applications, um, industrial bioprocessing, as well as basic research. And so we're really a company that's laser focused on the core technology. And so far, we've partnered with other companies to help them deploy gene editing in their product development cycle. Uh, so for example, we've worked previously with Novartis around drug discovery. Uh, we've worked with DuPont Pioneer on ways to deploy gene editing and plant breeding. Um, and we're currently working with a British company called Genus uh, to help them deploy gene editing for pig breeding uh, and other livestock applications. Um, there's also the tremendous potential for this technology to really transform human health. Um, and we're co-founders of another company called Intellio Therapeutics that's really uh, taking this technology and hoping to apply it to uh, genetic disorders to actually correct the underlying mutation and hopefully treat or even ideally cure the disease. Um, as well as ways to use gene editing to fight various types of cancer. Thank you. Um, and of course, there are a lot of questions about what does gene editing mean and how will it change us? And um, you know, do you just edit or do you also, apart from deletion, do you also add? And that's, that's when the big questions uh, are raised about the technology like this. Um, James, um, Toyota Research Institute, are you making flying cars? <laughs> 
The Toyota Research Institute was created a little over a year ago with an initial billion dollar investment from Toyota uh, to really help it develop artificial intelligence for the next generation of advanced safety and autonomy for its vehicles. Uh, we also spend uh, about 30% of our budget on next generation robotics, uh, particularly to support aging society. Um, and then the final part that we work on is uh, what we call accelerated scientific discovery. The idea that we can use cloud computing and uh, digital models of molecules to, for example, find new battery catalysts. Uh, potentially, uh, if you could replace platinum, you could have, uh, according to the th theoretical chemists, uh, two orders of magnitude in energy density. So you could have a car that could be powered by a battery the size of a cell phone. Um, and we're also looking at new materials science as well. Uh, but our core focus is really on the software um, and to power advanced safety. And one of the concepts that we're looking at is uh, what we call Guardian, which is um, there's forward collision warning and automatic emergency braking that a lot of cars, and if you buy a Toyota in the US in 2017, it'll come standard. But imagine if your car would keep you safe uh, and statistically, automatic emergency braking reduces dramatically rear-end collisions. Uh, we think uh, we can do a lot better um, with uh, better sensors and, uh, and smarter software. So basically, if somebody gets behind the wheel of a car, that person doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> In the future, um, uh, of course, currently, uh, you know, when people say, when are we going to have driverless cars, of course, the, the key th question that has to be answered first is, under what conditions are you saying that? Um, if you're talking about highway only, that means no traffic lights, no crosswalks, no pedestrians, no bicycles, clear weather, light traffic, we could do that safely today. But if you're talking about downtown Zurich in very terrible weather and very you know, rush hour traffic, it's going to be several years before we'll have that technology. So I think um, you know, it's, it's accelerating rapidly, but um, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Great. I think there's also this huge school of thought, which while we're talking about driverless cars, there's a huge school of thought which says we should just have less cars. But that's, I think, another discussion we can have a little later uh, in the afternoon. But let me come to John. John, Local Motors, what do you do? Local Motors is a technology company that is changing the way in which we bring products to market. Uh, we are a rapid product development company that uses two methods. One, co-creation, which is open product development, and the second is powering that by micro-manufacturing. <coughs> and so the focus of Local Motors' first products have been ground vehicles. And so we are capable of bringing vehicles to market five times faster with 100 times less capital investment using co-creation and micromanufacturing. You could best think about it as open source applied to hardware, so Linux as opposed to DOS. Micromanufacturing is not really magical. It's just simply using more of a digital ecosystem as we are creating vehicles from the ground up. Uh, the current vehicle that we're offering right now is Ollie. It is a level four autonomous vehicle that is deploying this year in the United States and in Europe. And so uh, we have our first vehicles in Knoxville and in Berlin and in Copenhagen right now. And so uh, um, that is what we're about, bringing high technology to uh, products. Um, more broadly, uh, our holding company serves Airbus, General Electric, and Hewlett Packard right now in using co-creation and micromanufacturing to rapidly develop the new products that they are working on. And so if you think about it, the days that Saikichi Toyota and Taiichi Ono and uh, Henry Ford and Frederick Taylor brought us refinement and Kaizen and mass manufacturing methodologies, we are establishing a capability of bringing products to market using the internet and a distributed supply chain uh, to be able to bring these products to market. Uh, we started up 12 years ago, so I like to think sometimes about us being an overnight success 20 years in the making, and we're about, <laughs> we're about halfway through. So, uh, um, so our next product is Ali. Uh, you'll see one in Switzerland this year, and uh, we will produce about 1,000 of them next year. Uh, and uh, so driverless cars, there you have it. Well, everybody wants to have a driverless car, but maybe we'll just uh, talk about less cars some other day. Uh, <laughs> let, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's come to uh, Alec. You've, you've written a book about the future of technology, future of industries. Um, 
what do you see as the key change which is driving the growth in innovation? Sure, I think that, I think that land was the raw material of the agricultural age. Iron was the raw material of the industrial age and data is the raw material of the information age. He who owned the land and controlled the land during the agricultural age had the economic power and the political power. During the industrial age, he who owned the factories and controlled access to the natural resources had the economic power and the political power. In the industries that are being described by my co-panelists, he or she who own the data, control the data, or can harvest meaning from the data are those that are creating the industries and businesses of the future. Now, in as sophisticated an audience as this one, you don't need a big, you don't need a primer on data analytics. But I do think it's interesting to note that 90% of the world's data, 90% of the world's information, has been produced in the last two years. And in fact, if you take the sum of all data produced from the earliest recordings of humankind, literally the paintings on the cave walls in France. From paintings on cave walls to the year 2003, the sum of that data we now produce every two days. Every two days we produce as much information as was produced from paintings on cave walls to the year 2003. And so as we are producing these Pacific Oceans worth of data, it's enabling us to do things like have vehicles that drive autonomously. It allows us to harvest information from the 20 to 25,000 genes that are in each of our bodies to be able to do things like diagnose illnesses earlier, develop custom pharmaceuticals or other such things. And my own perspective on this is that with all of this technology driven change, my own personal focus is on the, is on the human dimension. What are the moral, the ethical, and the economic dimensions of this? You know, people who tend to think about these things are either utopian or dystopian. It's either, oh, we're gonna to live to be 150 years old, happy, healthy, wealthy, lacking for nothing, no more car crashes, or it's dystopian. It's sort of eyes closed, fists clenched, <laughs> the world is gonna be like Mad Max. And so my study of this is, is really focused on how these changes drive both the promise of the future and the peril of the future. That's well said. Let me, at this point, uh, you know, one thought that you, and two words that you mentioned, I found that bit dystopian and perhaps rooted in the past, own and control. Right. Um, these are words which would be used by industry leaders of the past. I own this, I control this. And it's, it's a bit paradoxical that you're using these phrases of owning and controlling data as the new uh, method of, of driving change, which I'd like you to hold the thoughts on these and maybe come to the audience also later, which I find slightly interesting, but let's, let's take I a think, look at the... I think Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon right. are doing a pretty good job of holding and controlling data. So I don't see a paradox in this. So is that a good thing? Is that what we need to be worried about? You know, again, I don't think it's good. Or I, don't th I think there are good aspects to it, and I think that there are bad aspects to it. Um, you know, I like that if I get lost, I can go to Google Maps, and because it has ingested so much data, it can tell me where to go. I like... Uh, that when I go to Facebook, I can connect with my friends um, and find out what's going on with them. And oh, by the way, I don't pay for a single Google search. I don't pay for a single Facebook post. But there, but are you don't pay by cash, but you do pay for it in some way. You pay for it by offering some of your personal information to a corporation who will monetize it in a way that you will not perhaps benefit. And that's the negative side. My point exactly. So I'm not paying a monthly fee to Google for my Google searches. It's not for every 100 Google searches, it costs 10 euros. But you are handing something over. There's an exchange of value, a transaction. And so in the same way in which we regulated land during the agricultural age, and the choices we made about how to regulate land were consequential, and in the same way in which we regulated industry, factories, mining, and other such things during the industrial age, so too in today and tomorrow's economy, the question of if and how we regulate data is going to be very consequential. Stay on this thought for a moment, Rachel. The data that you are working on, you know, genes, the absolute core of our existence, and you are, you know, playing around with that a little bit. You're taking a little bit out and putting a little bit in. It's with plants, animals, um, food products, almost everything that impacts our existence. That data, 
and the control of it, its ownership of it, how relevant is it for your work? It's incredibly relevant. Um, we can't be helpful, we can't solve any problems if we don't first and foremost have access to genomic information for the organism of choice. Um, so for example, for a lot of plants that we all eat in our you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, there's actually very little high quality genomic information um, still, even today, available for these species. Some of that's because they're biologically complicated, um, and some of that is, is for other reasons. And we're actually starting to see a number of the companies who are otherwise competitors with each other in these markets come together, cooperate in investing in building these high quality data sets so that they all have access to them um, and then can ultimately use their own propri proprietary competitive advantages to develop their own products off but, of that. But the information about my genes mm -hmm. is with you. Uh, no, I don't know anything about your genes. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, I haven't come to you yet, but I'm sure there would be people who would be coming for getting their genes, uh, uh, you know, play around with them a little bit. Um, that's what you're working on. You have, a, you have a product which you're licensing to others. Right, so in, in the healthcare system, there's obviously tremendous regulation around how um, any company or research center can gain access to a patient's personal information. Um, and often you go through a, a very long consent process if you're a patient or if you're volunteering in a trial. Um, and you typically only consent for providing a very specific type of data. Even if you're providing a sample from which the researcher in theory could pull all kinds of other pieces of data, um, they're only allowed to look at the data that you consented to them having access to. And so I think we're now finding ourselves in, in the biotech world of people have a wealth of information in the freezer that they're not allowed to look at and they're not allowed to use. Um, or they have access to information, but they're not allowed to share it with others. And so in a world where we'd like to be able to share more data with each other, for a variety of reasons, we're not able to right now. So let me share a small fact which Rachel uh, you know, updated me yesterday about. We had a conversation. Uh, her technology, which she's developed, CRISPR, and if you haven't uh, had your coffee post-lunch, then this is going to wake you up. Her technology, CRISPR, is in the list of WMDs. Can you tell us more about that? Right, we were a little surprised, I think it was last year, um, to find that the highest ranking intelligence officer in the United States had listed CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing um, on the uh, list of potential weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, there's, there's North Korea, there's Russia, and then there's <laughs> gene editing. Um, <laughs> slightly unusual. Um, and now you know why I was worried about my genes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think part of that comes from, this is actually a field that's been around for about 15 years, but CRISPR, this particular type of gene editing technology, is very new. Um, it's much easier to use than older types of gene editing technologies. And so it, it's really sort of democratized gene editing uh, in a way that anyone who's trained a little bit in molecular biology can now use this uh, in the laboratory. I should be super clear, it's easy to use if you know how to work with um, cell lines or, or other types of cells that live in the laboratory. It's not easy to edit a human. Um, no one is working on editing humans right now. Um, and all of the therapeutic applications are looking at blood stem cells and other very specialized types of cells and trying to correct mutations in them. Thank you. I've been an editor all my life, but this word now takes a completely new meaning uh, with, with your technology. Let me pull up the question uh, uh, that we have for this session. Um, it, it goes beyond the technologies that we're discussing at the panel. Uh, which technology will have the biggest impact on society? And I'll request uh, the, the board to uh, put up the questions. Artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, biotechnologies. Um, None of these, which uh, I'm probably not going to tick on that one, but please do, do vote on this and we'll come back to these uh, questions and thoughts uh, a little later uh, in, in the day. Um, I, let, me, let me go across to uh, James. James, we are also discussing, is there something to be afraid of in these technologies? So there is a mix of anxiety and excitement about technology, right? And, and you saw in the previous panel with, with Neil uh, Harbison where a lot of people didn't say that they would want to have an implant in themselves, but then we also know that for the last 20 years or so, several 
technologically led implants are already there in human bodies for correcting so many ailments and problems that we have. So there is a paradox, and again, there's a, contra a contradiction of sorts there. Um, at your research, do you come across these, these kind of questions of whether to or whether not to? I think it's safe to say that in many of these fields, the technology will develop despite uh, our best intentions to prevent it in many ways. Um, and almost all these technologies do have a double-edged sword where there's, they could be used for good or they could be used in negative ways. Um, I think the important thing is, is to, to have the discussion, which is wonderful that St. Gallen and, and an event like this tries to think about them you know, in advance of them happening so that we can sort of look at the end state. The way I look at all the technologies that we're working on um, we think that uh, the benefit that they'll provide will be tremendous in terms of safety. I mean, the fact is that, you know, over 1.2 million people are killed every year in car accidents worldwide. In the U.S., it's about 36,000 per year. Uh, we could do much better than that. A lot of the accidents are caused by human error, drunkenness, distractedness, drowsiness. Um, that's something that machines aren't suffer, don't suffer from. So I think we can do a lot better, and we can also um, uh, look at the technology as something that's aiding. I think in the history of humanity, we built machines as tools to, to augment our abilities, whether it's construction or farming or agriculture, um, and uh, for thought. So the computers that we've invented, um, you know, I always like to point out that today's computers cannot be designed without a computer. Uh, they're the most complex machines that humans have created. So in some ways, you've already ceded control <laughs> to another machine, because you can't create a better machine without going to a machine. Not really ceded control. What you've done is augmented human capability. So uh, you know the, the construction But that's machines. a polite way of saying, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean, they are still, there's still an element of design. I think what is new and why I think there's an increased discussion of artificial intelligence is that in the last 10 years, the rise of big data and neural networks and deep learning um, have led to a more automated approach where instead of manually designing the algorithms, um, you train this neural network. And it's beautiful in the sense that all it requires is the data. And as uh, Alex pointed out, you know, it's, it's sort of the new gold or the new oil or the new value chain, especially when the most advanced machine learning algorithms are mostly open source, whether it's Google's TensorFlow or Theano or Torch. Um, all of these open source software give you access to the best machine learning. And I had joined Google in 2009 and built their you know, self-driving car prototype back then. And there were only a few companies back then where we had access to the cloud. And I felt like I was a software engineer with superpowers because <laughs> suddenly I had access to incredible data storage and compute that, that only a few people had access to. But now with the public cloud, anybody does. So anybody who wants to start a company and use big data or use these tools and all the machine learning software is open source, um, you have incredible potential. And so people are really talking about it now because suddenly you don't have to design the algorithms. Um, you know, they're powered by data. Uh, and and, and you know, later on we can talk about sort of my philosophy about how to uh, prevent them from getting out of control. Yeah, but I think we need to take a moment to absorb just now what, what, what he's just said. He's talking about training a neural network. It's not about animals, it's not about other humans, it's about training uh, software to do something which the software should be doing on its own later without direct and constant monitoring and supervision from, from humans. So, you know, we need to, even just wrapping our heads around this concept will, will take a while. That's something that you do as well, in terms of creating artificial intelligence that's going to drive change. But what is it that makes you afraid of that? In, in that process, and what is it that excites you? 
I, I mean, the truth is the future is here, but it is unevenly distributed. And so uh, James has brought up a number of good points. I mean, one is uh, when will we see driverless cars? The question is really under what conditions will we see driverless cars? Um, we take advantage at our company of exactly the same things that you just stated. It would have been impossible for us to build local motors, uh, both either to 3D print vehicles or to be able to build a self-driving vehicle. And now all of those things are possible. So what excites me is um, that it's a, it's a more distributed future for everyone, meaning that there is a rush to judgment to believe that the world will be monetized by software. I actually think that the marginal cost of software is zero, and also the marginal value of software in many cases is zero, um, because there are so many people that can work on it. Controlling the data is something that's different, though. Being able to use it to be able to achieve effects that you need, um, it's all too easy to jump over the fact that gene editing is great um, for the data, but actually I would believe that probably what Rachel does requires a great deal of work in order to be able to do it. The same thing happens for a lot of other things in the physical world that are often ignored. So what excites me is there is a future for the blue collar. There is a future, as we heard yesterday, for the people from somewhere. That excites me. And what worries you? The, uh, what worries me is that uh, I think that the, um, uh, that the tyranny of the way in which uh, we think about machines um, leaves us with a lot of questions and people could misunderstand them. Uh, so to speak specifically in this audience, um, do you believe in a soft deterministic world or do you believe in a hard deterministic world? Uh, we have reached a singularity of artificial intelligence already. Um, um, in many cases, uh, um, we now have, you know, uh, Watson having beaten um, the best chess player in the world, the best grandmaster in the world. However, um, the best grandmaster in the world plus Watson beats Watson. And so um, the question is, reprogramming a neural network, does it take a human to do it? Um, and if you don't believe so, what is your dystopian view of the world? So it frightens me what people would do with these things or against these things to be able to stymie process or progress, excuse me. Um, uh, that frightens me because I think that uh, um, the singularity uh, for a machine to be able to teach itself let's say, or to pass the Turing test or other items like that um, is not necessarily to be feared, uh, just better to be understood. You know, folks, you should mug this moment because you're hearing phrases which will become ordinary lexicon in the weeks to come. Training neural networks, singularity of artificial intelligence. These are something which will be, you know, slipping off our tongue in the, in the next few weeks as we go back. These are exciting things which look very opaque to us. We don't really understand what's going on, but we can see some of the impact in the way that they are delivering solutions to us. Alec, we, we were talking about the... Uh, he talked about distribution of, of technology. I'm talking about the epicenter of innovation. So there used to be the Silicon Valley, and, and uh, three of you are from that part of the world. Um, the, the Bay Area, United States, the, the founts of technological innovation, the big global giants are emerging from there. Uh, not much happening in Europe, perhaps not, little, uh, not much else in Asia or Africa. But do you think that the epicenter of change is now shifting and it's becoming going to different places because the solutions for the world cannot be found in Silicon Valley alone. Yeah, so let me make, let, let me preface that by actually responding before I answer that to, to the, some of the points that were just being made. Uh, let me make one point about artificial intelligence, which is that humans are not as easy to update as software. <laughs> And so while I, while I do think that a lot of us are going to benefit from partnering yeah. with machines, and while I do think that, you know, loss, you know, reduced loss of life because of car accidents and other such things is a good thing, I'm just asking, asking that we keep both eyes open and recognize, for example, that in Europe, the number one occupation for men in all of Europe is driving a motor vehicle. And it's a job that you can get without a university degree. So I think it's important that we, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's going to enable human behavior. But you know what? If you're a truck driver, you absolutely should be afraid. Now, that's not to say government should keep autonomous vehicles from happening. But let's just, let's be honest about what the second and third orders, the second and third order effects are. We're going to be fine 
if you're hit, sitting here at the St. Gallen Symposium, you are probably working in the knowledge-based economy. You're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. But just be aware Alec, that so many people are not. Can I respond sure, to please, that? Sure, please. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a real trouble with telling people to be afraid on that. And the reason why is if we were to go back to the agricultural economy where we had greater than 50% of the people in Europe employed in farming, and we were to tell them in 50 years it's going to be 10%, and in 70 years, it's going to be 3% of the people, and you should be afraid. Uh, that wouldn't be the message that I would tell them. The message I would tell them is, today there are mokes. Today, most everyone has a smartphone. There is an opportunity for you to learn and be engaged in the future. And so I, I hear that there is change a coming, but the tools to be able to be part of that change are much more evenly distributed than they were, and I wouldn't want people to retreat to feeling like they need to uh, forestall the change in their life. Well, look, I, don't, I agree that we don't need to tell them to forestall the change, but first of all, mokes are horrendous if you actually look at the data. Um, you know, the average course completion is around 3%. The utopianism that came out of Stanford and others about how this is going to democratize access to higher education has proven basically to be totally false. Uh, in terms of the data around the agricultural revolution, you're absolutely right. The thing is, what we're not talking about is a 50-year timeline. We're talking about a 5- to 10-year timeline with mass displacement of labor. Look, I am anything but a Luddite, but what I do believe is that we need public policy that recognizes that our industrial age social contract and our industrial age public policies do not map, do not map well to an increasingly technology rich knowledge based economy. But here I would, I would also make the distinction and at one point here which is interesting is that it's also a time of very rapid and short cycles where something like MOOC which was so contemporary and avant-garde is already history and this is less than... Just a in, total failure. Absolutely. So the point is that a lot of these technologies will come, they'll, they'll shine for a few seconds, and then they'll disappear. So you and have so, to get and, used to that. And so let me connect that to your question, which was about the geographic concentration of well-being. So if you look at the actual economics of the last 25 years and well the tri where the trillions of dollars of wealth have been created, there's been an enormous amount of concentration in an area that's 30 miles long and 15 miles wide. And of the five people sitting on this panel, Three people live there. Three people on this panel live in an area that is 30 miles wide, 30 miles long and 15 miles wide. And guess what? That is representative of where trillions of dollars of wealth have concentrated. And I'm not saying that's bad. God bless Silicon Valley, because I bet you weren't born there. But you were born You were born in Texas, right? right? Where were you born? Texas. And where were you born? Oregon. So what Silicon Valley is, is it's not a place where Californians benefited. It's a place where people from all over the world came and benefited and imagined and invented the future. But let me interrupt you, Alec. Let, let, let me come back on this point. I don't think the gods are going to be blessing Silicon Valley for very long. <laughs> the reason is... Huh? The reason is, if you look at what's happening in China, I'm from India, and I think that's why they got an Indian to manage four Americans here, is... <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the fact is that in the last two years alone, 240 million Indians have joined the financial mainstream, and they haven't used a bank, they haven't used any technology from the Silicon Valley. Um, people are using payment wallets, they're using mobile networks. It's the same in China, and, and just had a great session uh, with, with Samuel Agutu, who's, who's doing similar work using mobile technology in Kenya. The point is that when we talk about technology and disruption, we talk about blockchain and artificial intelligence, these are now, and to, to his point, these are tools available to everybody. They are being further built on outside the Silicon Valley space, outside the European structure and framework of solutions, and therefore, I think this epicenter or this one fount of knowledge that we're used to, I would think that it's, it's not going to be there anymore. Sorry, Rachel, you wanted to. I think that's true, but I think it breaks down in certain situations. So I applaud the broadening of uh, innovation. I think it's only better for society. There are people who are smart outside of that 30 by 15 um, box. 
But where I think it falls apart is if you need significant investment to get your idea off the ground, there's still a very small number of concentrated areas with those investors. Even in the United States, um, I have a number of colleagues in the industry who've come up with phenomenal ideas for new companies. They try to start them in wherever their hometown is, and so many of them struggle to do so and ultimately find themselves in Boston, Bay Area, or New York to be where the money is. And so I, I think there, that's still a fundamental bottleneck to all of this. So I think that there will be sort of 12 to 5 foci globally, which will be sort of the HQs for the industries of the future. I think Silicon Valley will probably remain number one. Um, so I don't think we're going to see a descent of Silicon Valley, maybe on a relative basis. But I think we're we could do a vote on that. OK. Would uh, we, can we do a vote on this? Do you think Silicon Valley will remain the technological leader for the world? Those who say yes, please raise your hands. For how long? That's a good question. But I would say, let's say, five years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, 10 years. OK, so it's reducing. But I should also tell you that we are still looking at half a decade and decade as if these are short periods. They're not. Remember what we just discussed about MOOC. Within the space of three or four years, they disappeared. The technology which we think about is very relevant. And I think the relevance of technologies is also very important. What works in Silicon Valley, what works in Europe, in Africa may not work, in Asia may not work, in Latin America. So I think that's, that's an important point. Let's, let's pick up the, uh, the survey and the question uh, and see what the answers are so far. Uh, if I can request the uh, results of the vote to be put up and see which of these technologies will have the most impact. Can we get that on the screen? All right, artificial intelligence, no doubt, will have the biggest impact on society, biotechnology. So you're right up there. Uh, blockchain and augmented reality is, is a very weak second. But I think that's also because um, the applications of blockchain and, and augmented reality are still playing out. And the understanding of how they would be applied, uh, I think that's still evolving. But let, let, let's take a pause and take some of the questions from the audience um, and see what, what people have to say. Is this technology? creating anxiety or excitement. It's a combination of both. What should we be looking for? Um, thoughts and questions from the audience. Cyborgs can also ask questions. <laughs> so can we have a mic with him, please? Yeah. So in these times of this accelerating technological change, which undoubtedly boosts productivity quite a bit, where do you see the role of an uncondi uh, unconditional basic income? in the next 25 to 50 years? OK, that's, that's more of an economic question. But you're also talking about job loss. So maybe, Alec, if you'd like to respond to this. Sure. So I think that people forget, you know, as we went from an agricultural economy to an industrial-based economy, we created a new social contract. Things like pensions, free public education until you're 18 years old, um, a minimum wage, all of these things were a byproduct of a new social, excuse me, a new social contract written during the Industrial Age. What people have forgotten oftentimes is this period from 1800 to 1840 called the Engels Pause, during which there was rapid technological innovation, but stagnated well-being for the working classes. And the byproducts of things were of that were things like the the Communist Manifesto, which was written in 1848 the largest wave of, of revolutions in Europe's history in the 1840s. Eventually, the social welfare state emerged, and the industrial age sort of held for 110, 120 years. <laughs> I think that as we move from an industrial-based economy into an information-based, knowledge-rich economy, where you don't have one employer for 30 years, uh, where you may have 20 employers in, in 30 years, and where we aren't building massive middle classes, uh, to produce goods and services, but it takes a relatively small number of employees to produce these goods and services, I think we basically need to rewrite our social contract. We need to rethink the relationship between state, capital, and labor. And a universal basic income could very well be a component of a new social contract. I do think that it is much more likely to be implemented first in places in Europe than in the United States. Because Europe is inherently more collectivist, and the United States is, much, is inherently much more individualistic. 
Um, Europe is much more concerned, Europeans, I'm speaking in sort of broad, broad generalizations, but there's much more concern about inequality in, the, in Europe, and there's much more concern about what we broadly call opportunity in the United States. And so to the extent that I think a UBI, a universal basic income, is a likely byproduct of the next social contract, I think that it would likely emerge in Scandinavia, in northern European states, and then if it proves successful, evolve elsewhere. And I'm actually not optimistic about the United States in this respect. If you look at what took place yesterday with Donald Trump's dismantling of Obamacare, what that is doing is it's, in t it's saying that which is redistributive, that which is collectivist is evil and we're going to dismantle it. And so I think tensions across a lot of our societies have to do with an environment of increased bounty and increased spread. And, the, and those kinds of questions are gonna be the most important pu public policy questions of the next decade. But in some ways I would say, Alec, and to answer uh, your question, some variants of UBI are already in place in Asia. So a lot of the subsidies which are given on different products and services are now being bundled into cash which is being directly pushed into account digitally. And that's happening in my country. So may 60 to 80 million people have got this in the last few uh, months alone. So what happens is instead of they getting a subsidy on fertilizer for agriculture or, or for uh, buying any other product of uh, petroleum, uh, et cetera, what you get is direct cash and you go and buy it yourself. So you control that money, and you just get that money because it's allocated as a subsidy, but it's coming directly to you rather than the leakage of the system. So there are variants of this, I think, which also would, would emerge in different uh, markets. And I'd like to actually sure, add please. one more item to that, and that is there is the discussion of UBI, or universal basic income. Uh, there also is another way to think about the way in which we me measure health and wellness. Today, the, the sort of dominant uh, metric is gross domestic product, which is defined by corporate and individual wealth largely. Uh, the truth is that when you look at sort of the three jobs that were predicted, or three of the jobs that were predicted to be most difficult to be taken over by a computer, law, doctoring and driving a vehicle now are all in some cases better done in an artificial intelligence world and so if that's the case the question is how do you value your life do you value it based on income or do you value it based on access to sunshine or the limited time you spend in a commute or the more time you can spend with your children I took my 13-year-old to an artificial intelligence uh, convention, and he was wanting to be a lawyer before he went. <laughs> and when he learned that it was possible to read all law and present case facts and give several best fit answers to a uh, judgment through a computer more than a storied lawyer, he thought, wow, maybe I'll never get paid, and maybe I won't need to get paid. That was a 13-year-old's view on what artificial intelligence might mean to their world. So UBI is one response, just give me money so that I at least know I'll have something while the machines rule the world. But I think we also need to look at how we define happiness. And so I sat next to Dr. Beiger on the uh, first dinner that we had, and he was right there at that moment and said, just please make sure it's not a metric for happiness. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's something that's critical for us to think about is it doesn't have to be. We objectify happiness with income right now, but we could be talking about pollution, and we could be talking about distance of commute or the cancer rate in your local area. These are objective metrics which would be better ways of measuring the health and wellness of society. We don't have to just have an income, but it is an important part of what we do. Yeah, it's always good to have more money. The lady over there, please. Hello, my name is Katerina Lengold. I work in the aerospace industry, and we are innovating a lot in trying to make satellites, satellite data more affordable. But what we've seen is that policy making is outdated and it stops the progress because there is no legal framework for what we do hasn't been revisited for decades. Um, we mentioned massive open online courses. The debate about whether this education is you know, real or not hasn't even started and the technology is already outdated. So how can we bridge this gap even if we cannot can it adjust to technology fast enough? How policymakers that are naturally much slower, how can they adapt 
on time so that we can live in a society that is balanced and the technology isn't running too fast while the society is still back there. Thank you. Well, the short answer is they can't, but still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, would you the, like to the, respond? The, the reality is, is that we will coexist with AI in the future. Yeah. So there's no reason not to start thinking about it now and thinking about policy. Um, I think a lot of really good points. I think points. the question is also the ability of policymakers to absorb yeah. the changes, understand the changes, and then regulate or create a framework which is futuristic. Yeah. But th is that too much to ask? I mean, this whole conference is a uh, symposium is about disruption. And I think a lot of the ingredients is a partnership, strong partnerships between industry, academia, and government. Those three uh, players have to be involved when there's a big disruptive technology. So thinking about how the technology will be implemented, how society will embrace it uh, or shape it, and creating the right incentives. Sometimes it's not regulation that's the answer. It's just creating the right incentives. I think that's, that's important from, what, uh, from the point of view of what you're doing, Rachel, because it has several ethical issues, privacy issues um, of, of you know, gene editing. And as you said, you're only editing and you're deleting, you're not adding. But where is the policy framework on this? Do they even have a grasp of what you're doing? That's a good question. From my limited experience, I would say I think innovators have some responsibility for helping to educate the regulatory and policy community. Um, it's populated with really bright people who have way too much to do. Um, on the sort of human health side of our, our application space, that's a very well-trodden path. I think understanding how to measure safety and efficacy is going to be reasonably straightforward. But on the food side, um, most of the core regulations that govern how these products are regulated were written before I was born. Uh, they did not anticipate any of the technologies that have been used in the past several decades at this point. And that leaves uncertainty, um, which is confusing for consumers. Um, and so helping, finding ways for the big food companies and the smaller innovating companies and everyone in between to be part of the dialogue of how we pull that framework to match the products that are being developed and launched right now so that consumers can have a better understanding of how their products are being assessed for safety. There, are, think, there are examples of policymakers who have gotten it. I mean, I worked for four years for Barack Obama, and I ran technology policy for his first presidential campaign, and he was great. I mean, he really did understand. He would get into the technology, and if you looked at the Obama administration, um, there were really strong technology policies. Unfortunately, you, uh, I think a lot of people here would object to how he used it in terms of surveillance, <laughs> but he certainly understood the technology, and, and in the private sector context, he understood it well. There are examples of other leaders. But he did um, a great job on the drone technology, for instance. He was, you no, know, he was tremendous, and he understood it, and if I wrote him a memo, you know, the next morning he would come back with questions that showed, you know, he really, really got this stuff. The problem is, is that that's very unusual. Um, so you're saying that the next level of political leadership. Yes. So it's we not need there. now. What we need are people who have grown up in this world, and who have worked in the private sector, who have been entrepreneurs. We need these people to become more politically active. Um, it's the only. I mean, it's the only answer. I mean, these technology policy issues, things related to artificial intelligence and telecommunications, and all of these things. These are the most important drivers of public policy over the next ten years. And I think it's very important for people who actually understand this content to get involved in public policy, because if you don't, you're going to get the same old folks who just don't get it, and then you get very frustrated with them when they regulate things in the wrong way or their policies are out of date or what have you. So I think we need to really be encouraging people who have been successful in this world and telling them, you know what, you should get interested and engaged in government. So technologists should, should join the world of policy making. Yes. But there is a risk because some people would argue that if you allow them to make the policy, then there is no check and balance because they're so into it that they don't see the change of the technology from different dimensions, which a person who's not a technologist can see the social impact, the political impact, and such. Yeah, there's no checks and balances now. It's just all lawyers. I mean, you know, the... That's, not, that's not going away for a while. No, but, but this is my point. You know, if we're worried about no checks and balances, if right. you actually look at the composition right now of political leadership, 
you're going to get 20 lawyers for every technologist. I think we can change that ratio without worrying about things getting out of balance. Great. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I can take maybe two more questions. Um, right. I see one hand here and then one hand right at the back, and I think that should be good. Maybe I'll collect both the questions and then I'll come to the panel. Hello, ahead, please. I'm Hemin and I come from India. Uh, and my question is, uh, do the panelists actually believe that the intellectual property and the patents of all the technologies should be kept free and open-ended? That's a great thought. Let me go to the gentleman at the back. No, hang on, we can't hear you. One second. Hello, hello? Yes, yes. So is that better now? Okay, I'm coming from, from Germany, from a uh, dramatically aging population society. We've talked a lot about uh, job losses. There's a study by BCG that says that we might be missing 8 million working people in Germany by 2030. So there might be a point that uh, with uh, automation uh, delivered by machine learning, artificial intelligence is right uh, a time to support Germany to, to achieve or to maintain a level of, of welfare that we would not have because we're just missing the people. So what do you think of that point? Thank you. That's a great point. But let me also add one simple thought. Germany is leading the drive for automation for every other country in the world. Yes. And you are, you are saying that Germany should actually hold back so that its own welfare can be done. But the no, impact no, on some of the other countries is even no, no, more that tremendous. No, that was not my point. We need to increase the speed of automation, because we're going to dramatically lose people that are able to work because they're aging. Right. So on the question of IP, would you, would you like to uh, yeah. weigh in on that? So we promised at the Sangalan uh, Symposium challenging questions. I think we've glanced on, or challenging debate, we've glanced on a couple of things here. One of them is that Silicon Valley's dominance in uh, building wealth is something that I believe very much is of the past. Um, I, I may sit here as an American, but not somebody that lives in Silicon Valley right now, and we have had a disproportionate bubble associated with the internet economy, which is being disrupted by an incredible amount of entrepreneurship around the world, and we would be myopic to believe that it lives in a 30 by 15 mile area in the United States. I'm an American and a great patriot, but I can tell you there is a huge amount of value in the rest of the world. Massive, massive, and please come to Silicon Valley because it's a great place to get food and meet software entrepreneurs, but if you are looking for a hardware entrepreneur that can change the world, you will not find it anywhere within that 30 by 15 matrix, and that includes Elon Musk. And so the bottom line is he lives in LA. He lives in Los Angeles. It's a long way away from Silicon Valley. And so IP is one of those closely held things that is out there. IP is a is something that if you think about the creations of it in the United States, Ben Franklin was famous for saying it's a way for somebody to transmit information. It has become a way for patent trolls to hold on to value. Nathan Mervold, other people like this that have built entire portfolios around bottling up intellectual property and trading value, it is becoming a thing of the past. And you need only look at the backlog at the US Patent and Trademark Office to understand a truly broken system. It should be open. It should be available for people to actually make great products and services that can change the world. There's a huge push. I mean, if you look, Bill Gates is famous for saying, give me 10 good programmers and I can put all the hackers in the world out of business. The same week that Linus Torvalds was saying, do you pine for the days when men were men and wrote their own device drivers? <laughs> now, despite the misogynist tone of that, I think the bottom line is that he was right and Bill Gates was wrong that Linux has become the most powerful operating system in the world, and open source, if managed correctly, with speed, can deliver an incredible amount of value. And so I think IP is broken, and it needs to change. So that would be my answer to that. Rachel? Yeah, I, I think I have a slightly different perspective on that. Um. Except, <laughs> except in one industry, I should say, and it is in the biomedical industry, so Indeed. Um, enter. <laughs> certainly in, in the version of the world that we live in right now, um, having that level of protection around an early idea that's going to take 10 to 15 years and hundreds of millions of dollars that if you get lucky might be a product someday, um, it's, it's the first currency you have as an entrepreneur um, is that you can begin to write patent applications and ultimately get patents around your core fundamental innovation. Um, and it's your ticket into the door to talk to partners or investors. 
Um, it, it's not to say that it's the only thing you need, um, but it, it's certainly quite critical in the early days and then ultimately once, once you're on the commercial market. I, like, I, would, I mean, what I would simply say is that while intellectual property policies can be reformed, I think it's naive to say we can live and work in a world without IP. Um, that's, that would be like saying during the agricultural age, everybody go forth and farm, but none of you actually own the land. Or, hey, you know what, you guys can pull all of the oil and the gold out of the earth that you want to, but you don't actually have mining rights or drilling rights. You know, so I think that the only way that investment flows into these business models more often than not is from venture capitalists who look to invest in an idea. That idea then has the opportunity to become monetized. Um, look, James's point is absolutely right in that you have to, you cannot have a tyranny of patent holders and of intellectual property holders, but thinking about a country like Switzerland, Switzerland's GDP, uh, per capita GDP, is one of the 10 highest in the world for, in significant measure because of its big companies that are IP holders that are selling into businesses around the world. So I think that, you know, look, there's a utopian strain of thinking that says there ought not be intellectual property, but I think that's unrealistic given the forces of markets, where there can be things like Linux operating systems, where there are collaborative, pla where there are collaborative pro platforms, where software uh, engineers can collaborate and create products, both for the market as well as for the, the common good. That's great. But as a very practical matter, most of the things that need to be built need to then be sold. And in order for them to be sold, there has to be economic value to both the entrepreneur and to the investors. And therefore, you will need a lot of lawyers. Yeah, the, you know, that's, it. <laughs> that's where a lot of these lawyers are. Trust me. You know, the, they, they, uh, they're not going out of business very soon. So, you know. Well, hopefully more of them go out of business. Soon, right. But. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think um, intellectual property uh, is unique when it applied to software. Um, it, you know, I worked for Google for almost eight years and some of their main products, Android, Chrome, their artificial intelligence crown jewels of TensorFlow, everything's open source. Um, I think we need IP to do protect the ideas and drive investment, but I do think that the system currently is broken because there are patent trolls and there, there, there is a system that's essentially where patents are are not used really to, for companies actually trying to develop it. They're just used to try and extort money out of, uh, out of other people. But I think that uh, when we think about data and, and, uh, and open source and openness to data, um, when I joined Toyota, one of the things that it, uh, attracted me was that um, when it comes to things uh, with regard to the environment, traffic, or safety, they're very, very open. So two years ago, they open sourced all 6,000 of their fuel cell patents to the world. Um, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and, and they've said that if, if, we, if our company develops a new safety breakthrough, that uh, they're willing to open that and share that because in many ways they have a moral obligation to if it saves lives. Right. So, you know, we have a couple of minutes left. We'll have to wrap this session up, but let's, let's end on a positive note. The topic does say, is there anything to be afraid of? What should we be afraid of technology? I think my answer is, no, be careful, but not afraid. Let me come to all of you for a 30-second closing point on one exciting technology development or application that you're looking forward to, which you see happening, applying, and deploying in this year. So I begin with you, Alec. Yeah, I think the CRISPR technology. I think the idea. You, you took her line. <laughs> yeah. No, but I look. You know, I think that the idea that we can repair damaged DNA. Uh, of a child still in utero and reduce the likelihood that that child is going to grow up and get Parkinson's during adulthood. It, the, if we are able to identify uh, malfunctioning DNA, RNA, and repair it uh, so that debilitating chronic diseases uh, do not make life miserable, then this is absolutely something that we should be doing. And I think that it is, I think there's evidence that, you know, based on the investment and the innovation taking place here, that it's a very promising technology. The last trillion dollar industry was written out of computer code. The next trillion dollar industry, I believe, is going to be written out of genetic code. 
Great. Rachel, you have to top this. Well, I'm, I'm going to agree, but disagree, actually. Um, <laughs> obviously, I drank the Kool-Aid on gene editing, but I'm not comfortable with in utero editing. Hmm. Um, and so really, what I'm most excited about is some of the trials that are kicking off later this year and early next year to test this in blood disorders and in cancer. I mean, I think the potential to try to open up DNA um, as you would open up a, a Word file on your computer and try to rewrite the broken bit and actually cure someone's disease it's science fiction, uh, and I, I really, really hope that we see that And you see this happening in 2017? So the, the first trial kicked off last year. More mm -hmm. trials are kicking off this year and early next year. So very early, hopefully, proof of concept. James, so what, what do you see most exciting happening this year, 2017, so that when we come back in 2018 at St. Garland, <laughs> we say that, you know, we said it here first. <laughs> Um, I think there's uh, incredible breakthrough in perception for intelligent vehicles and robots. Um, when we think about what is difficult, um, I think for robots and intelligent vehicles, it's about capability, about reliability, and cost. So make it work, make it work well, make it work cheap. And what's really exciting is that in the last year or, or two years or so, um, these new sensing technologies are allow uh, enabling incredible reliability in terms of perception and uh, understanding the, the state of the world around an autonomous system is really the key. It doesn't matter how good your planning uh, software is, if your understanding of the state of the world is wrong, you're going to do the wrong thing. So um, to me, I think the, uh, the new LiDARs, the new 3D cameras, uh, uh, and all these uh, new sensors um, are going to make our systems far more intelligent and reliable in the next year. It's like trying to pick between your children, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> there's just so many exciting things going on. But, what a, okay, what end a, of this yeah, year, what do you see what happening? What a great way to end in such an optimistic note. So I'll pick one that's exciting to me, but there are so many. Um, uh, revolutions are always, in many ways, the biggest ones are silent. And so in this particular case, you know, we were predicting cataclysmic amounts of manure in 1907 in New York before the automobile came into the streets. Right now, I think that high power to weight rate ratio electric motors this year are going to be incredibly exciting. We've seen the first flight of a quad lifter drone bringing someone from one place to the next 30 miles um, with almost no cost and no maintenance. The ability with that married up to ADAS-B in the air means that flying is going to become safer, cheaper, and more accessible, airports are going to be able to be redistributed close, and it starts with the high power to weight ratio electric motor. Uh, we've had a flight over the English Channel this year with an electric plane that made almost no noise except for the wind slipping through its motor. It's going to be an amazing year for power. Ladies and gentlemen, remember you heard it here at St. Garland in 2017. Please join me in thanking the panelists for this exciting session. <laughs>